live. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That's right, we're live. It is the Audible. It's the footballguys.com podcast. It's Cecil Lammy, Sigmund Bloom, Matt Waldman, Dr. Gene Bramall, and some bad Thursday night football. I know it's not quite halftime yet, Bloom, but let's give us an update. And reason why it's not quite halftime normally when we start right. the show is because of a weather delay. Yeah, and this has just been a game, uh, some ineptitude. I mean, Jameis Winston's making enough throws to move the off fence now Chris Godwin is racked up a few catches but really um, this offense is continuing to underperform you have to give some credit to the Carolina defense and some momentum for Ronald Jones coming into this game uh, run into a brick wall more work for him now it's actually Peyton Barber Peyton Barber did have a nice move on a reception uh, in Carolina you're just seeing an offense that is not very explosive not very dangerous or imaginative uh, very good play from Christian McCaffrey and this is Curtis Samuel's game so far in terms of the Samuel versus Moore uh, battle for supremacy and he has the deep throw and Greg Olson's looking a little bit older uh, but an underwhelming game to say the least it is the audible live and of course you know we start with Dr. Gene Bramall talking all things injury and Hello, welcome to the chat room who's reacting to me and well to us and Dr. Gene and I'm reacting to Sam Darnold with mono. I don't mean to joke around about it, but it always just makes me think of Wayne's world. But he's like, I thought I had mono. It turns out I was just really bored. So yeah, it's mono for Sam Darnold. This is unusual, Dr. Gene. Yeah, a lot of mono infections just end up being respiratory infections without too much to be concerned about. But there's a percentage of folks that get mono, um, usually older folks rather than younger ones, who have spleen enlargement, and that can be very dangerous. Your spleen is basically, a, you know, not to be gross medically here, but just kind of a big ball of blood. And if it gets hit in a contact sport and your spleen ruptures, that is a medical emergency and can be a big deal. So I've seen players like Jason Witten and others in the past have spleen cuts on the spleen that can be a problem. But when your spleen swells, when it's already bloody, it can be a big deal. You can also get liver inflammation that can be a problem, lots of fatigue, fever, those sorts of things. It's a contagious illness, so you probably don't want them in the locker room. But I think the primary concern here is probably uh, spleen enlargement. And Stefania Bell, was on ESPN today saying that she talked with a medical officer for one of the teams and said that, um, told her that one of their protocols is that they basically shut players down for 21 days and let allow their symptoms to be the guide after that. So you would imagine that that was probably a standard approach from a, uh, a medicine doctor, um, that it would be the same for most teams. So three weeks is probably where we are. We've heard as much as four to six weeks. And I won't say this is indefinite or open-ended, but it's going to be a period of time before he's cleared to come back. All right, Gene, I'm going to give you a chance. You know, this is like we're at the amusement park and the ones where you roll the balls and try to make yours get to the end, win the stuffed animal. And the three competitors here are Tyreek Hill, Hunter Henry, and Darius Geis. When it comes to the return to play, give us the order uh, so we can put our ticket in and win some money. Put our ticket in and win some money. Who's first? Who's second? Who's third? Um, I... I think Hunter Henry is probably going to be third, although it's hard to say with Darius Geis. If Darius Geis has anything more than a very minor trim, then he could stretch longer. Um, but I think Geis is probably likely to come back first. Those recoveries are on the order of three to six weeks. I think Tyreek Hill is going to be four to six and probably closer to six. His injury, the, the few comps that we've seen have kind of been in the five to six week range. So I think that's probably what we see. And I think, I think the target with Hill is week seven against Denver. Um, Hunter Henry, you know, there are lots of variations of these tibial plateau fractures. It seems that because he was able to finish the game and um, they're not putting him on injured reserve, that this is probably going to be in the four to six week range. So those guys, I think, are going to be pretty close. And then it's going to come down to, does Geis need surgery? When does he get surgery? How quickly does he recover? And he's going to be in that three to six range. So I, I think the per guys has the best chance of bit getting back the soonest, but he probably has the widest range of expectation. I think both of the other players are going to be in the five to six week range at the earliest, and it's going to depend on where they come after that. So I, that's a that's a good uh, that's a good battle to see. We'll see how that goes. Ask me in a couple of weeks, and we'll have, probably have a better sense of who might be the first one. Gene, staying in um, with the Chargers a little bit here. What do you think the outlook is for Mike Williams' knee injury? What are kind of the ranges that you're looking at that you think are appropriate to speculate on? 
Yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting thing. Um, you know, as usual, we're not getting much out of Los Angeles. You know, the Chargers, the beat writers really don't have a lot to add, generally speaking. And I think it's probably a good thing that we've not gotten a formal diagnosis from, you know, Adam Schefter, Ian Rappaport, Pelissero, what have you. Um, and that probably means, you know, that we, what we are hearing out of Los Angeles, that it's just a sore knee, is hopefully accurate. We've not heard that he's in line to have surgery for a meniscus injury. And we haven't heard anything about a specific ligament issue. Uh, I didn't get a chance to review the All-22 yet, but from the television angles, there really wasn't anything obvious. It's hard to know whether he banged his knee on the way down or if he did take a little bit of a funny step. There just wasn't much on the video replay for me to go by. Um, and hopefully I'll have a little bit more on that as the week progresses. Um, so it's hard to know, but um, to miss practice all week doesn't seem like there's much chance of him playing this week. So is a little bit of a contusion where we're just kind of on a day-to-day -day situation and he's just not going to be ready this week, but next week is possible. I don't know that we're going to know that unless we get a little bit more formal report. This could be another one of those situations where we get the report after he's pretty close to being declared and active where we finally get an idea of what's going on. So it doesn't seem like this is going to stretch into a three to four plus week absence, um, but I don't know that we've got enough information to say that for certain yet. All right, Dr. Gene, what's up with Tyler Lockett and this back thing issue? Yeah, I, I don't think there's an issue there. Um, it's not been a lot from Pete Carroll, and usually he'll talk if he's – thinking the player's going to come back or he'll talk if it's going to be a little while, but there really hasn't been much from Seattle. I don't get the sense that the local beat writers are all that concerned. Although he didn't practice on Wednesday, Thursday's practice was a little bit more reassuring. He was able to at least get out in pads and do some um, exercise drills and some individual drills. But the deal with back injuries, as we've seen so many times over the years, is uh, if it ends up being muscular and you've got some muscle spasm, that could crop up at any point. Um, if it's more in the contusion side of things like it is with Deshaun Watson, probably, you know, both of those guys, we're going to see whether or not they have any stiffness or range of motion issues. And if something comes up on game day, I think we're probably going to see a fuller practice out of Lockett. It won't even surprise me if they don't list him on the game status report and don't even give him a questionable tag. Um, but it could go the other way too, depending on how he responded to Thursday's practice. So Friday's participation report is going to be pretty important for him. Gene, I'm not going to ask you a specific question about this week's games or a player right now. I'm going to venture into maybe some murky water, but Rob Gronkowski said he had five blackout concussions, 20 or over 20 concussions. But there are a lot more concussions in the NFL than we're being made aware of, even in this concussion conscious era. Is it a hot take if I say yes? I don't know. I, I think, you know, I think that over the last decade, we're seeing more and more and more players and teams understand the importance of self-reporting injuries, but this is still a tough guy culture and players want to play and players want to play through injury. Um, and, you know, you still get the sense that if you're on the back end of the, not that Gronkowski ever was, but on the back end of the roster that, that players are going to probably try to stretch things. Um, you know, by 20 concussions, does he mean that he had his bell rung 20 different times over the past four or five years? Not sure what that means. Five um, episodes where he had some sort of brief loss of consciousness um, sounds really concerning. We've talked in the past that loss of consciousness, while it's a symptom of concussion, doesn't necessarily mean that um, that the that the recovery is going to take a little bit longer. It's not any any more of a poor prognostic sign than than some other symptoms are necessarily, unlike amnesia or something like that. But yeah, I mean, I, it would not surprise me at all that if you know if you put every NFL player um, under some sort of truth serum, we heard that, that there were a number of injuries, possibly every week, that go unreported by players. And I hope that's less and less the case over the years. But yeah, I, I think that's a reasonable, exp you know, possibility. Gene, so what's the outlook on Le'Veon Bell's uh, shoulder injury and really long term, obviously, because a running back has to lower those pads and, and initiate that type of contact? You know, how do you feel about his season pro um, prospects right now? Well, based on what we heard today, it seems like the MRI was just a let's check in and see if there's anything of note there at all. It's been termed precautionary. Um, Le'Veon Bell himself has been very reassured by whatever the results are. There doesn't seem to be any concern that he won't be able to play Monday night. Um, and without knowing precisely what they were looking for, you know, was it rotator cuff? Was it labrum? Was it AC joint? Was it any number of those other things? Uh, it's hard to put a, a relative risk on the, the chances that he might suffer an aggravation at any point. But 
but everything seems to be optimistic um, after he had it. And, you know, not having the MRI until midweek, you know, basically Wednesday for him playing on a Monday night football game um, is a pretty reassuring thing, something that they just, you know, thought, well, maybe it's a little bit more sore than we thought it'd be by the middle of the week, so let's get it checked out. And NFL players seem to have, you know, they're, they're, it's not unusual for them to get MRIs just as kind of a precautionary thing, whereas URI, that wouldn't be the case. He is Dr. Gene Brammel from footballguys.com. Follow him on Twitter at Gene Brammel. And, and Dr. Gene, I hate to be like JoJo the idiot circus boy, but did you notice all this stuff we can do now with the chat room? Yeah. Look at that. Joe yeah. King. yeah, that's Gene what I was laughing at. I had to mute angel. myself before because I was. <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing and eating Skittles. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Uh, well, this one comes in from the chat room, and I'll just do this. Look at Look at all these little toys now. Hey guys, did Dr. Gene talk about James Conner yet? That's from River 74X. Um, shouldn't be much concern there. You know, I, as we've seen with Sam Darnold, we can't write off every time a player is listed on the injury report with an illness. But for the most part, that means they don't want a player anywhere near the rest of the locker room and taking a risk of where two or three guys maybe have an illness that it becomes 20 or 30. You know, we saw that little bit of concern with Tampa Bay last week, and that's probably what's been going on with the majority of these other players. And um, James Conner listed as full practice participant on Thursday, you know, barring some sort of unexpected situation there. He should be good to go without any limitation come the weekend. Is there any way sorry to cut on here bloom but is there any yeah. way we can judge about this illness designation because i mean sorry joe but usually when i read illness i'm just like oh what's he got the shits like what, or like what's this little <laughs> stomach stomach bug right i'll make sure to edit this one out <laughs> mark mark the time but seriously like <laughs> we're making these decisions like it just says illness. I don't know if that means a tummy ache or now mono, thanks to Sam yeah. Donald. And really yeah. sorry, Joe. Well, I mean, we've had, uh, I think we've had people with uh, very serious blood clots listed as illness. We've had players with, um, you know, cancer scares listed as illness. For the most part, as a default, I think you should assume that illness means somebody came into the um uh, either reported or came in with a fever or, yes, had a stomach bug. Um, those things are very contagious. You don't want a fever illness to go through the locker room. You definitely don't want a stomach bug going through the locker room, um, even if it's going to end up being a 24-hour thing because just, you know, as you said, no, you know, sorry, Joe, but it's just going to run around right through the locker room. <laughs> I so wanted Dr. Gene to cuss. So yeah. uh, it, it, it rarely if ever point. does that. Yeah, that's going to be the game now for the rest of the I don't show. know if I'd go rarely with ever, but I'm I'm happy to censor myself <laughs> on yeah, Thursday nights. <laughs> okay, Gene, speaking of censoring yourself, uh, th this is everyone's favorite game. Tell us what's going on with Todd Gurley's knee. Nothing. I mean, it is what it is. This is not any different than what we talked about in March in June, in July, and now. Um, he has some cartilage loss in his knee. We know his knee gives him trouble from time to time. The Rams know better than we know what exactly they're dealing with and whatever steps they feel like they need to take um, to, to have Gurley as available as he can, series to series, game to game, month to month through the rest of the year. So I thought Andrew Whitworth gave us a little bit inclination to what the Rams may be thinking when, you know, he said trying to hold him until the second half. Um, you know, this is a little bit different than what we talk about with wide receivers and tight ends with, with soft tissue injuries when they're going to be there on a snap count, when they're going to be put in high leverage situations. Well, you know, maybe a goal line carry in the first quarter is not necessarily considered a high leverage situation versus if the game's still tight in the third quarter. And maybe you want Gurley there over Malcolm Brown. And, you know, running backs don't matter, notwithstanding. Um, there are times where you want your very best talented player on the field to give you the best chance of success. And, I, and, and analytics aside, I think that's what we're hearing from Los Angeles with respect to Gurley. The knee is what it is. I, I think it's been great that we made it all the way through training camp without any setbacks in practice and without any deviation from what the the 
the initial veteran plan was to be. And we may still see from week to week that things change. But, you know, I know in the first half last week, it was what's going on, what's going on. Malcolm Brown is getting higher usage than we expected. And then in the second half, it was mostly Gurley and he looked okay. Um, you know, Matt did a lot of video work on Sunday and Monday talking about, well, it looks like Gurley's burst is there. It looks like his um, cutting ability is there. It looked like he had some stamina as the game went on and, and kind of likened his, his week one game to his first preseason game. And, and do we see his usage change if he doesn't have any knee issues moving forward? Maybe. Or this is what we're going to get from Gurley where it's going to be, you know, like we said from the beginning, it's going to be a week to week situation. They're going to see what they have and make a decision based on how he feels in the moment. All right, Gene, I want to ask you a two-parter. One is just kind of a follow-up on this Gurley question, and the other one is about Dante Pettis. Um, in terms of Gurley, um, is, could we hypothetically say if Gurley never injured his knee in that um, Chiefs game and played with an MCL tear, because that's I believe that's what he had, um, would it be possible that we would have never known about this arthritic condition and they would have just kind of kept it quiet, and and we and if we had known, we wouldn't be making such a big deal out of it. And then I guess the second question is, with Dante Pettis, you know, he was listed with a groin injury, but not really listed big time on the injury report. But knowing the type of style of play that he has, which is, you know, someone who's very quick but likes to use that mobility and flexibility, especially with releasing off the line of scrimmage and breaks, where you're going to really extend and plant that leg. Could that be a type of an issue where you could practice because with practice it's just kind of more walkthroughs and certain types of drills where you can, you know, half ass it a little bit um, and and protect that leg. But then when you're going to really open it up and play, you, you might not get a lot of playing time because you're not quite ready. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I, I think I think if there was some any concern, I mean. Yes, you're right. They're probably not going full speed in practice with regard to Pettis, but allowing him to full practice. And then if I'm remembering correctly, I don't even think he was listed on the game status report as questionable going into last week's game. Might be wrong about that, but I, you know, all expectations were that the groin injury that he'd been battling a little bit was a non-issue going into last week. So to see him only play a couple of snaps um, was meaningful. And I know that, you know, y'all have been going back and forth about is Kyle Shanahan telling the truth about Donnie Pettis not playing as well during the preseason? There's still some things he needs to do. Was it a motivational situation? All of those things. Uh, I think that probably has goes in play more with this than anything else. Um, just, and he's not listed he's fully practicing, not even on the report as a full practice participant as if he's getting extra treatment so far this week. So I don't know. I, I think there's probably multiple things going on with Pettis. The injury may be playing a slight role, but you know, I, I, if it's playing a role it's because he there was a little it set him back a little bit towards the end of camp and didn't allow him to get back into the good graces of Shanahan and the um in the Niners offense um who else That's am I talking about early. oh yeah so I um I, I, I don't know it's it's really hard to say I think it's much more likely that the injury to the cartilage started at the time where he had his ACL injury um ACL injuries can be isolated but they very often involved uh, involved the medial ligament on the inside of the knee, the MCL, very often will have a meniscus tear, which overlies that cartilage and have some cartilage damage as well. Um, you know, the focus for rehabilitation and surgical purposes is the ACL. So we often don't hear about um, associated injuries like MCLs or other ligaments and meniscus slash cartilage issues. So I think it most likely started there. And he could have even had some degenerative situations even before the ACL injury. Um, what uh, you know, Lots of studies, whether it be back injuries or knee injuries, show that NFL players have degenerative conditions in and around joints, whether it's knee joints or shoulder joints or hip joints or what have you, including the back um, there. So that could have been something going on. Hit, playing through an MCL injury and having your knee joint a little bit looser than usual put your uh, put yourself at risk of having some of those other injuries. Yeah. Um, because your knee joints a little bit loose and, and maybe tissues bang into each other that, that wouldn't ordinarily. And you have a little bit of cracking and, and cartilage loss because of that. Um, but I think it's really hard to say whether or not, um, you know, had he 
chosen not to play through this soreness or that looseness or something like that, that, that wouldn't have been that much of an issue. And uh, I, I, it's been in the news a lot more. It's been the, the primary issue through the preseason between Michelle and then what's gone on with McKinnon. And now we're seeing some of the same things with Geis. Um, this is this is what happens with NFL players with wear and tear. And, you know, wear and tear kind of sounds like not such a big situation, but it is um, what these guys go through on a week to week basis. And some of these injuries are, you know, not like a bruise on the forearm where you give it a couple of weeks and, and there's actually there's absolutely no long-term effects. A lot of these things are, you know, each down they play on these degenerative joints is probably taking series and games off the back end of their career. He is Dr. Gene Brammel from footballguys.com. And Dr. Gene looks like we can get another round in with y'all. So I certainly appreciate that. I'm still trying to figure out what game Bloom was talking about. With rolling the balls, yeah, the it's like there's, car- there's, it's like a little horse, the, the little like running, you know. Sometimes it'll be a pig, or just you can put anything on it, and it, depending on you get oh, the but first you have to roll level, the ball, right? you roll yeah. the ball up. Oh, and okay, it's like the first level they go like three spots. Yeah, this was a game at the minor bar, wasn't it? It was at the Bentleyville uh, Volunteer <laughs> Fire Department <laughs> Carnival in the summer. It was right after my birthday, and even as like a ten or eleven year old, they would let me gamble, and as the little Sigmund Bloom loved that. Love rolling balls. Yeah. All right. Uh, Christian S. with the question here, Dr. Gene, and this is the one that it's been kind of weird because there's this stuff going around about Tyree Kill and about how this injury is really unusual and that, as Christian says, well, well it could have been life-threatening, right? He needs to be 100% healthy, healthy, healthy before stepping out on the practice field. Like, there's been just kind of this buzz, mainly online, Dr. Gene, nothing like anybody's reporting it or whatever, but it's like, you know, this is super serious, this is more serious than they let on, this is a weird injury, this has got to be right, and he can't come back until he is. Like, so I've heard that, like Christian asks here in the chat room, what's the real story here? Uh, You know, what do we know about Tyreek Hill and, you know, his recovery time, whatever, but just like... The nature of this injury, is it really as unusual as you know people are, are saying it is? It's unusual because it's a high velocity injury and because of the way the the shoulder and the chest is protected, it's, it's not a common thing that happens even though it's a collision and traumatic sport. Um, when you get driven into the ground, it's usually your shoulder or you know your face hits the ground, what have you. You're not really taking a direct blow to the chest. So kind of what's happened here is if you know you kind of come into the middle, I don't know, I'm doing this backwards because it's like looking into a mirror here, but you know when your collarbone comes into your breastbone there and it gets pushed directly back, that's where all the big blood vessels that come up out of your heart and go out to your, um, go out to your, through your upper arm and the rest of your body live. And if that bone gets pushed back, if the collarbone gets separated from your breastbone and pushed backwards, there's really nothing there except those blood vessels um, and the top of your lung. And both of those things are big deals. If you get a collapsed lung and it doesn't get treated quickly enough, you can't breathe. Um, and it puts pressure on your heart. And obviously that's not good. Um, if you tear one of those big blood vessels, be it a, um, be it a vein or an artery, uh, that's, you don't have a whole lot of time because of um, how much pressure those things are, even the veins in that area, they're going to bleed quickly and be an issue. So um, how soon can he come back? Well, you know, at this point, once they're, they're, been proven to not be any injuries to those structures and you put that end of the collarbone back in place, now we're waiting for the ligament to heal. And in general, torn ligaments, which what is what happens when you have a joint dislocation, I know this isn't the same as an elbow or a knee, but we've dislocated the collarbone away from the breastbone, so it's a dislocation. It takes six weeks or so for those ligaments to really heal enough to stabilize the joint again. Now, it's going to take even longer than that for it to heal, so the question then becomes, Um, what's his range of motion like? Is he going to be able to protect himself on the field and do everything that he needs to? And are we still having some pain or any relative movement when he gets examined? Um, So it becomes not that much different than an MCL sprain or an AC joint sprain or something else where the ligaments need to heal. It becomes a pain management issue. It becomes a range of motion issue. It becomes a can you protect yourself and play the game of football issue. Um, and if the joint is healed well enough and the joint is stable enough, then you know you have to go back to your. You, 
if it happens in the in the same unlucky way that that joint gets stressed out again, then maybe you have a little bit higher risk. But I don't think they're going to let him go back to that point. And just because those structures are are there doesn't mean that he necessarily needs to be held out a little bit longer. So we've seen we've seen this injury once before. Um, I gave four comps last week, one being Danny Amendola, the case report that was published in the medical literature about Amendola. Um, the orthopedic surgeon in that said that this is the first known instance of this in the NFL. Whether or not that's 100% accurate or not, it's hard to know. But, um, you know, the docs will talk back and forth and the training staffs will talk back and forth about these injuries. And, you know, because everybody wants to take care of the players as well as they can. And it was believed to be the first injury. And Amendola's was the very same thing, where the, the collarbone was pushed backwards. Um, ben Roethlisberger had a similar injury in 2012. Jake Kumaro had a similar injury. Both of those were sprains, where the ligaments were sprained, but there wasn't a full dislocation. Um, uh, Amendola was back in five weeks. Roethlisberger came back a week sooner than that. Um, people are pointing to Jake Kumaro's injury as you know a big concern because he was put on injured reserve and didn't come back for two or three weeks after that. And it wasn't, in my opinion anyway, and it, I think it's supported by what the Packers folks reported last year, um, it didn't take him 11 weeks to recover. It was, you know, Kumaro wasn't a huge part of the offense. You know, he was he was playing well, but he was a, a minor. And they didn't have five to six weeks to, to carry him as their fourth or fifth wide receiver with all of the other rookies and other players that they had available to him. So I don't think it was that he needed all 11 weeks to return. It was, it just made sense for the Packers roster. And then Darquez Denard had a a little bit of a similar injury, but the, the bone came forward instead of backward, and it took him about four to five weeks to recover. So um, I think Amendola is is a reasonable comp here. Again, this is a rare injury, so there's not a lot to go by, and there are going to be, you know, things specific to Hill's exam and follow up. But I, I think I think four to six weeks makes sense with the buy being where it is in Kansas City, and um, and with Denver coming up, you know, shortly. It just makes sense that week seven looks like. I mean, that's six weeks. I think that's a good target. I don't think I don't think it's likely to be under that, um, but I don't think that um, week seven is going to be too soon. And the Chiefs' medical staff has always been very good. They're not the uh, I wouldn't put them in the group of teams that is, are likely to push players back. It could absolutely end up being eight weeks, even though they didn't choose to put him on injured reserve and designate him to return. But I, I think six weeks is reasonable, and we've seen that comp safely be met in the past. Gene. For people that have Giovanni Bernard or Joe Mixon, do that thing you do, like the three-dimensional coordinate plane. We've got <laughs> no practice, limited practice, full practice on Friday. We've got the kinds of things that we're going to hear, what the significance might be. And then the background of the Bengals and Mixon, the history of those the staff, Mixon's injury history. What should we expect mm-hmm. and look for tomorrow? So I, I think two important things about this injury is, one, when you look at it on video, his foot – kind of rolled and rotated. It definitely wasn't a high ankle sprain mechanism. It didn't look like a particular violent situation. And that seems to have been supported by the Monday MRI, which was, quote, all good. And that doesn't mean that there's not any structural, there's some sprain issues there for sure, but nothing that suggested that it was going to be a long-term injury. But that doesn't mean that, you know, just because you've got a low ankle sprain, or maybe this one's a little bit higher up on the ankle, not a high ankle sprain, but a ligament in a little bit different spot than the one that you'd normally think of when you just roll it to the outside. That doesn't mean that a player can recover in time to be uh, ready for an NFL game. He looked like he was doing it. He was listed as, a, as, a, as not practicing again on Thursday, but the beat writer said that he was doing a little bit more uh, off to the side on the rehab field. And Mixon and Taylor, Zach Taylor, have both been pretty optimistic that he's going to go. But the second thing is that the Bengals, similar to the Steelers, if you're not practicing through the week, it's pretty unlikely that they're going to put you in a game plan. The, the toss up here is this is now Zach Taylor's team and it's not Marvin Lewis's team anymore. So that we may see Mixon be limited in practice tomorrow in a true game time decision where we're watching all the way up through Sunday morning, whether or not he's going to be able to go. So this time last year, I would have said Mixon is really, really to the doubtful side of questionable. Um, but this being Zach Taylor, this being the optimism that we've been hearing, it may really be that we're not going to use Thursday as our let's test you and see if you're able to go. It's going to be the Friday practice where we really put you out there and we wait until Saturday to see how you respond to that little bit of increased practice. So I think there's a chance he plays. I think the DNP, DNP, it would take a full practice tomorrow for me to be comfortable saying we're going to see Mixon see his usual 
two thirds of the carries situation. I think we're going to see a lot more of Gio Bernard this week, regardless of how mix and practices, unless it's a, a very, very optimistic Friday practice report. So you're pretty sure, Gene, that uh, C.J. Mosley is going to miss this week's game, and how long, much time do you think he will? Yeah, I, you know, we never seem to get near as much information from the national writers and the local guys about about defensive injuries. Um, but anytime you have a soft tissue injury or a player's not ready to recover, ruled out of a game very quickly after sustaining the injury, and then not seeing, not being seen in practice at all, um, then it's a concern. And the Jets will let some of their players rest during the week. They tend to put a ton of people um, on their practice report over the years, regardless of who the coach has been. Um, but the, the players that are going to play are usually listed as limited. So to give an example, you know, Robbie Anderson would sometimes not practice, but by Thursday or Friday, they were on the practice field doing something. So I, I, I'd be surprised if Mosley was active this week. And when you get a groin injury where, you know, it's, it's that significant and you're not able to practice that it's, it's, you would think it would be unlikely that he'd play next week as well. And I haven't looked at the jet schedule to see maybe when their bye week comes up or if there's, you know, if there are reasons for the jets to maybe hold them out a little bit longer than an extra week. But, um, you know, if, if there's absolutely no practice in one week, you start to worry that it's a three to four week injury. And hopefully we find out next Wednesday that he's already getting back to doing something on practice, but I'd be nervous that this is going to last a little bit. He is Dr. Gene Bramley. You follow him on Twitter at Gene Bramley. You check out his work at footballguys.com. And Dr. Gene, we certainly appreciate your time, brother. Always good to see you. Thanks, guys. Um, behave while I'm gone now. <laughs> that uh, may be difficult. Uh, that may be difficult. Matt, I want to ask you something. Extreme close-up. I want to ask you something, Matt, because the chat room's going nuts about this. What the hell's the matter with Cam Newton? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think one is that he changed his throwing motion. So part of the problem is, is that when you change your throwing motion and you've been doing it one way for years, just an off season of work isn't going to make a big difference here. So there's going to be probably a little bit of a problem with that. Um, some of the throws that he's making that he is completing, they're, they're close throws with that might not be exactly pinpoint. Then you also have the foot issue, which may be better in NFL terms. But then when you watch his mechanics, you see sometimes where, you know, he's throwing the ball where his shoulders seem still angled upward as if like he's not comfortable maybe putting pressure on the foot in the, in the way that he needs to drive off of it. Um, so there are a number of different things that could be the case with what's happening with him. And, uh, we're just going to have to kind of wait and see, you know, whether or not it gets better. By the way, Bloom, yeah. we need to do this or get five-ish on it, right? Somebody yeah. somebody good with graphics because, Matt, I got to tell you, brother, I saw you earlier. And every once in a while when we're doing this show, you'll see the remote, right? You'll mm -hmm. see the remote. And I'm like, if there was – because anytime I read something that Matt writes, and I read everything you write, brother, and when, when I read something you write, it's always in your voice, right? Mm -hmm. Because I know you so well, and I, I have your voice close to my heart. But if there was a glamour shot of football guys, it would be Matt Waldman, like, you know, like this with the remote, like this, looking up at the TV reflection in his glasses, right? So we need like five ish or somebody to get on that bloom. Yeah. Because I need a Matt Waldman glamour shot where he's just like remote, remote, TV, longingly looking at the right. football on the TV. Right. And There's here's a the good, we can do one with the with the sunglasses, like reflecting exactly. the, the like Thelonious Monk, you know? Exactly. And in the there sunglasses, you. the a play, a, all 22, is reflected in the sunglasses. That's it. That's it. That's the image. There you go. There you go. It is the Audible Live here on Thursday night. Cecil Lammy, Matt Waldman, Sigmund Bloom. Bloom with a game update. Yeah, well, you really did the lead in there with Cam Newton. I mean, it's just, uh, again, I feel like this is uh, exotic smash mouth all over again uh, because it's year two. Year one was surprising. This was the kind of boring offense that I expected to see from Norv Turner that made me not excited about Panthers last year. And some of it could be Cam. I mean, the simple way I would put it, would be that he just doesn't seem to have that hunter's edge on the field. And you don't see it. I don't know what's going on with his foot, both with the mechanics or as a runner. But if he can't put pressure on a defense as a runner, have them play 11-on-11 11 11 football, or otherwise just have that aggressiveness in his game, and his mindset, then it really changes this offense. Saw Jameis Winston uh, push the ball down the field uh, late in the second quarter. Touchdown for Chris Godwin. So Godwin, uh, Evans made a few catches. Uh, 
Olsen's made a catch. So, I mean, there's some yardage there because these are soft pass defenses, but you're not seeing a lot of drives being finished. You're not seeing the running game getting on track. And, you know, some of the talk in the chat room, of course, Thursday night football. You know, we've had some good Thursday night football games over the years, but mostly we've had mediocre Thursday night football. That's what we have tonight. That's definitely what we have going on right now tonight. That's why we are here for you. And even Dr. Gene checking back in. He's keeping an eye on you guys and <laughs> gals, ladies, and fellas. All, in the chat like room. a whole yeah. monitor or something. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. If Joe's the mayor of football guys, Gene's like the hall monitor. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> and, the, and the school doctor. Right? He's, if he's the hall monitor, then you can bribe him with Skittles and he'll look the other way. So uh, <laughs> he's the cool hall monitor. <laughs> Where's my Skittles at? You know, you got to pay your tribute and Skittles. All right, let's jump into this. Matt Waldman, Sigmund Bloom, Cecil Lammy. And uh, chat room question. This one's coming from Gary about Dalvin Cook. And, and I'm going to throw in Alexander Madison in this too, Matt, because when I watched week one and I was, one, not saying, holy cow, Kirk Cousins not throwing the ball. Uh, but two, when Cook would run and look good in this, you know, Kubiak system we know well, and then Madison would come in, and it would be one of those rub your eyes moments. Like, well, that's not Cook's number. Oh, because it's Madison, but he looked like Cook. What did you think of of the Vikings ground game? And then, like Gary says here in the chat room, uh, opinions on Dalvin Cook. Could yeah. he end up the uh, running back one with offensive focus on the run and improved O line? Um, I don't think he's going to end up being a running back one, even though I think everybody's reacting to Week One, and and he looks great. You know, obviously, when you see him on tape, he gets a he gets an open crease and he's liable to take it 25, 30 yards, maybe 60, 70 yards as well in a way that a lot of backs can't do. But the fact that Alexander Madison got as many touches as he did week one and that you didn't really see much from anybody else, maybe one from Amir Abdullah late in the half. That means that uh, that Madison's a the guy they're going to lean on a fair bit to give a change of pace. And we have to remember that the Atlanta Falcons defense, other than Grady Jarrett, was pretty much awful in that game. And they and and the offensive line for Atlanta was so bad and it was so worse off that they were down by 14 early. And at, at that point, you could pretty much run the ball at will against them. And and even in the telecast, they were talking about how in the Vikings, you know, Chris Spielman was saying in the Vikings. Um, locker room or in the facility, they usually have like an opponent circled or or highlighted on a bulletin board as a player that they really need to be um, cognizant of. And he said he's rarely seen a, a defensive tackle be that guy in, in the Vikings facility. And that guy was Grady Jarrett. And and that was really the only guy who was kind of the, the monkey wrench in the works for, you know, this run game. So I love what I see from Dalvin Cook, but I think that what happened against Atlanta will be an anomaly. I think they're going to throw the ball more. I also think that um, you're still going to see a, enough of a split where Madison, as they continue to gain confidence in him, and he shows what he can do both as a runner and a receiver, that there's going to be enough of a split that Cook is going to be tantalizingly close to being a running back one, but not quite make it there because of the volume of touches. So, it, you know, I mean, you're going to keep him. You're going to hope that I'm wrong with that and that he can wind up delivering the way he looks in terms of the athletic side of his spectrum. But both of those backs are really good runners. The The difference between the two is basically Madison – is a guy who's going to break more tackles than Cook does, and Cook is going to be a guy who's more liable to house it and be able to make multiple men miss in the open field. Bloom, what's yeah. what are you doing? What's what is this? What's <laughs> you're, the, you're putting your hands on your face. I was like, uh, oh, just, oh, is he? He's like, beard. oh, my, it's my beard. My, beard. It's my, look, my luxurious beard. beard. Yeah, a tactile. You know, sometimes <laughs> my hands are just craving input. <laughs> Okay, speaking of hands craving input, uh, Alex. Hands on the desk. Some, yeah. Hands on the desk where we can see him. <laughs> That's where we can see him. Alex Evers in the chat room says, Winston is a yeah. struggling. Bloom, I want to kiss you. Let's yeah. talk about Jameis Winston. Yeah, again, it just doesn't give you a lot of confidence. I mean, uh, you've got Minnesota's defense, I think Chicago's defense coming up on Tampa's schedule. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm mixing that up with another team. They've actually got the Giants. And then the Rams and New Orleans and Carolina again. Um, so, you know, is this offense going to get on track? I mean, are we giving 
Bruce Arians and Winston a grace period? I don't know. Uh, with the talent they have, uh, it seems like it should go better. Uh, but we've Matt Waldman has described it very well. Uh, you know, Winston lighting the building on fire and then putting it out. I mean, catching it on fire in some fashion through his negligence. So, you know, I, I mean, this is Jameis Winston, and I suppose we can expand it over a larger uh, span to say, is Bruce Arians going to be fine with it for the season? But let's keep this all in the larger context here. It's the fifth year option. And you're talking about a franchise altering decision. I mean, you can say, okay, let's structure something where we're going year to year with Winston. Well, why? If you only want to commit to a quarterback to go year to year with him, then why even keep your franchise in that uh, churn that's never going to get out of that phase? So did Bruce Arians come back? And this is, again, Eric Stoner. I'll drop his name because I have these conversations and they stay with me with him. Uh, you know, did Bruce Arians come back for this, for a rookie quarterback next year? You know, is this more about maybe – um, giving uh, the next head coaching opportunity in Tampa Bay to somebody in his coaching staff, and it's about developing a coaching staff because it doesn't seem like it's about developing Jameis Winston. He's not going to change at this point. You know, again, from fantasy, I think you have a little remorse, especially with O.J. Howard, but even with Evans, although Godwin's having a good night tonight, uh, just because you know that this is going to be that real random number generator of a passing game. And then at what point, once Blaine Gabbard is healthy, uh, how, you know, how uh, much of a, a leash are they going to give Winston in, in terms of those games where he gives the game away? So none of this feels good. It feels like Tampa's just stuck in the same place as long as Winston is the quarterback and not in a good place like last year for fantasy. Well, and Bloom, you know, I've talked about it. There, there'll be some veterans available. Mm -hmm. Maybe sooner than people think. And maybe Bruce Arians, uh, Matt Bloom, either one of you guys chime in on this. Like, does Arians have that cachet to go and be like, get me this guy? No. Get me this guy. Get Jameis out of here. Like this year, not, not waiting for next year, but this year to get one of these veteran QBs that may be available around the trade deadline. No, I'm, I mean, but for what though? I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I don't know what the, the long term plan here is for Tampa. Um, and I'm not sure who would be available. I mean, what, Ben Roethlisberger's last go-round? I mean, there was a time that Roethlisberger fit Arian's offense well. But now, I mean, I, I would welcome it, Cease. Hey, get a second rounder out of Tampa for Roethlisberger at this point. Let's turn this into a Steeler show. Yeah, let's turn it into the Mason Rudolph era. By the way, uh, Matt, Captain Huggy Face says you've got the Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Amadeus, Look. Amadeus. Uh-huh. Amadeus. Matt Waldman there is the go. wild man. And we are going around uh, the NFL. Talking about something interesting, let's go back to the Jets because Trevor Simeon is in. You know what that means. Captain check down. Or at least guys that are close to the line of scrimmage. So Bill asked something that I was thinking about, Matt. And I love Louder with Crowder. I remember you and I, Matt, seeing him at the Senior Bowl. But can Jameson Crowder continue what he did in week one? Yeah, I, mean, I absolutely can. And I think that um, most likely that the, the Cleveland Browns um, pass rush and the ability to be able to cover deep will create scenarios where Simeon is going to be checking down often and you'll see a, a decent amount of volume on the Crowder. There you go. Bloom, what do you expect out of this, Jess? Because yeah. people are saying disaster now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, I mean, well, look, so – you see, so you covered Trevor Simeon. I mean, this is going to keep that horizontal passing game inclination of Adam Gase intact, which is why Jameson Crowder is a good play indeed. Uh, and then Le'Veon Bell and his shoulder, it's not going to get better. Uh, it, this isn't going to be an offense that generates very much. I think with Le'Veon Bell, I would probably take 75 cents on the dollar for Le'Veon Bell or maybe even 50 cents on the dollar. If we consider a, a second round pick, 75 cents on the dollar and a third round pick 50 cents on the dollar. And you think about players that you would take at that level right now, not original ADP, but someone you would take in the third round today, probably take that for Le'Veon Bell because I just don't know how exciting this offense is going to be for fantasy. The volume is going to be there. It's just like Leonard Fournette. The volume is going to be there. The touches are going to be there. You're 13 to 15 point floor in a lot of weeks as long as they're getting four or five six receptions but the big games that we saw from Bell in Pittsburgh aren't going to be there. And then look at the schedule. Okay, so you've got New England, a bye, Philadelphia, Dallas, New England again. Seems going to be 0-6. And then what? And how much do these guys buy into Gase's program? Gase, I can do whatever I want because I'm the head coach. I mean, it's going to get old fast.
Yeah, it's going to get old fast, and New York's not going to stand for it. Oh, you know, our buddy Manish Mehta is like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <"Take it right." laughs> clapping his hands together, like, get ready. Let's go. Uh, by the way, Bloom, super, super quick. Yeah. Does it change your mind at all that Dante Moncrief's dealing with the dislocated oh, finger? Okay, <laughs> that, that, there's your why. Moncrief. Yeah, I mean, you should never get to four drops in a game. And it wasn't even like his routes or anything else. I mean, the drops were just indicative of the way his whole game was. It, you know, it wasn't like this isolated uh, blemish on an otherwise good game. So I don't know. You know, again, it's turn two sealer show. Matt, can I, I add like something? It. Can no, I add something ahead. to this? Go ahead. Okay, because if there, if I had a chance to consult for teams where they would say in a way where they would say, "Listen, just give us a no fly list." Like these are right. guys that no matter how tempted we are, in my top <laughs> three would have been Dante Moncrief. Who are the other guy. two? Who are the other two? Come on. I, I don't know because he's the first one that I think of right away. Because <laughs> I mean, it, it literally is. He looks like he could be a good player, and and they think that they're going to be able. It, it's kind of like Cordero Patterson. You know, you can yeah. you think that you can make something out of him that he isn't. And I think Moncrief is like, oh, he's going to turn the corner. He's going to turn the corner. Well, if he hasn't worked hard enough on his routes, this. At this right. point in his career, no. it's unlikely that he will. So, and he still doesn't catch the ball extremely well. So, it, he's just basically one of those guys. It was like Aurelius Ben got passed around the league. Mm. You, you know, I mean, <laughs> he had some serious injuries. <laughs> hey, Aurelius Ben had some serious injuries. All right, I liked Aurelius Ben. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But you know, it was athlete, but the, the yes. technician Absolutely. part never came through. And sometimes it works. And the times, this is one of those bias issues that Adam Harstad would pop up somewhere and say, "This is an example of this kind of bias." Because the times that it does hit, it's spectacular and memorable, uh, and it makes us, it makes you want to see it. So, Matt, you have to come up with a term for this. You know, it's like th that thing where um, it's like uh, w when uh, someone, you know, the cliche is a woman would say, "I'm going to fix this man." You know, it's the same idea with these players, but you're never going to fix them. He's always going to be the same ladies. Don't get married. Do yeah. not add. <laughs> Do not add. <laughs> Don't, add. Don't blink. Don't blink. <laughs> well, uh, this one comes in in the chat room, and Matt, you're sitting there remote in hand watching the game, and this one kind of scares me. It's Crypto EE with a cryptic tweet yeah, or text tired. or chat. McCaffrey looks tired. Is there a concern season long that McCaffrey will get worn the hell out because he's all they've got? Um, I don't think so. And I, and I think that it's easy to for us to, to talk about a player and say they look tired and not really have a great chance of really understanding the context of all of that. I mean, I thought it interesting that Troy Aikman was like, well, you know, uh, Greg Olson looks a little slower and he doesn't look all that great with the back injury. And, you know, he is getting older and he just beat a linebacker up the seam for, I mean, like left him in the dust for a long game up the seam. So after like basically having something stuck wedged up his nose when he like busted something up due to, you know, how he fell with his helmet in the first half. So I, I'm kind of one where I feel like when we start, how would I put it? Kind of, uh, I don't know, editorializing on what we think a player looks like uh, on that situation. It's kind of dangerous territory. He very, very well be tired, but, um, you know, it could be a it could be a scenario where he's just briefly tired, um, kind of gassed a little bit on a, you know, over a series of plays. Um, but it's funny because you heard, you know, this was on the newswire that you guys put out, which was basically that, you know, North Turner wants to limit the snaps, not necessarily the touches. And so from that end of the spectrum, I could see where they're, they're going to be concerned. But I think the concern is more that they have basically unproven guys behind him. Whereas most people in the league, I mean, it seems like there's a, you know, there's five backs who could wind up being like pretty good. If you put them in, into the lineup, this With is stockpile. A, yeah. This yeah. one has no stockpile at all. Unless, you know, Jordan Scarlett's interesting, but. You know, I wouldn't look at this. This is a type of team that would be a candidate for a, a Kenneth Dixon or somebody like that, whoever comes, you know, free at midseason. Go ahead. Go, go, go. Well, I, I think one of the things I want to add to this picture is, again, this is from Panthers' office that we saw last year. So if Cam Newton isn't threatening defense with uh, his running ability, and if this offense becomes more predictable, then you know, even the same amount of touches results in more punishment for McCaffrey. 
And if he's not getting as many touches out in space, if he's not getting as many touches in a more creative way or against defenses that are off on their heels or, or deceived or stretched in a couple directions, then he will take more punishment. So, uh, I, I mean, I would be just concerned about the Panthers offense in general. Somebody said the over under for this game was 49. I mean, some of this is Thursday football, but if you go back and watch the Rams game last week, it was, you know, some similar things. So I, 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 think there's reason for concern but i think matt's absolutely right about not reading too much into how players look it can be sometimes a week-to-week thing uh but at the same time uh you know this is a, a doomsday kind of game for a player you take in the top three and when austin eckler runs in for a touchdown or overtime it's a doomsday for this guy and rocky <laughs> saki acts about a- acts <laughs> Yeah, you better ask the question. Uh, Rocky Saki asks a question. Too many Rocky Sockies. Uh, should I drop Melvin Gordon? Yeah, Bloom went virtual yeah. Bloom there for a second. Mm. Uh, what to do with Melvin Gordon? We've got shallow bench leagues, Matt. And, you know, guys, like, I'm going to get Gordon, and then we'll see what happens. And then you get stressed out because you're bench, and you want to pick up somebody from the waiver wire, and you don't want to drop Gordon yet, but you got to pick up this guy. Like, what's the best recommendation for what to do with Melvin Gordon, Matt? Well, I'm a believer that if your team's winning and you are winning in easy fashion and your depth on your, you know, with your reserves are performing well, um, then, and you really just believe that Gordon is going to come back and perform well when he comes back, then you keep Gordon and you don't worry about taking those other guys. But, you know, my real thought on this would be, why are you keeping Melvin Gordon? Like to, to me, the idea is that if, especially if it's a shallower league, um, yeah, you're hoping for things to work out well, but I don't think the chargers need him. Honestly, with Eckler and, and Justin Jackson, they don't need him. He's going to wind up traded at mid season to a team that he's unfamiliar with the scheme. He's he, he may not even be a fit with the scheme right away. Um, and then on top of it, how much of game shape shape is he really going to be in? And and to me, it's going to be about learning protections and, and learning the route tree and all the different things that they're going to want to do in that offense. And it might be a few weeks before he even performs well. So to me, it's a big risk to hold on to Melvin Gordon at this stage if you know that it's going to be several weeks um, and you need players. If you need players, you drop them. If you don't need players at this point, then you may be able to talk yourself into saying, don't be greedy with taking a player who might be a one-week wonder. Bloom, where do you weigh in on this? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to hold him. Him and Kareem Hunt. You have you do everything you can to hold them because with each passing week, their value will grow. I don't know what their value will be once they take the field. I just think there's some greater than 0% chance. It might be 0.1% chance that Gordon doesn't even play this year, that he and the Chargers just have an understanding. But even in that case, they do, if they don't come to that end, you know, we're looking at week six to week twelve. Um, now that if we're you're going to get cute and trade him, right? Yeah. Well, they could trade him. No, I um, mean you trading him to hold on. Oh, to in him. fantasy, because that's the value is the yeah. trade value. Well, to what you well, four, right? Yeah. What you ideally would do with Gordon or Hunt is hold them until the week that they return to the team, but trade them before they return to the team, and you know get something out of the hope the unknown upside there of those players because the value will kind of mature at that point. And then it could take off if they're still good and still have the opportunity. But the question with Gordon is, would he come back to the same role with the Chargers at this point? But on the other hand, Austin Eckler might not hold up. And at some point, uh, Gordon may have some negotiating power or otherwise, if another team loses a, a team in a Super Bowl window, well, you just mentioned it with Carolina. Like They don't have anybody. So they would be an interesting candidate, especially we got to remember this head coaches and GMs are coaching and GMing for their jobs. So if they're giving away someone else's second round pick next year to try to keep their job this year, maybe it happens. So I don't know. Uh, and we saw Jadavian Clowney traded for nothing. They gave up they paid half of his salary. Well, the Texans are idiots. So we can't. Yeah, well, there are other job. teams that could be idiots. There That's might true. be other idiots out there to take it. There's a That's sucker true. born every minute. It's one of the Bill American O'Brien's things. warming up right now. Like, yeah. What, are, what, what yeah. more can we do? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a sucker born every minute applies to the NFL too in many ways. Uh, so, anything could happen. So, you hold on to them to see what the pot of gold is at the end of the rainbow. It is there the audible. Know. It is the footballguys.com podcast. Uh, Joseph. 
wants to know, Matt. No Browns talk tonight, gentlemen. <laughs> We're saving Matt. We love Matt. So, you know, I mean, this is one of those ones where you, sometimes the most loudest thing you could say is nothing at all. Um, that was a rotten game, wasn't it? I mean, they were. How much uh, of it was expectations, Matt? How much of it was all? The how much it was a trash, garbage offensive line? Even Garrett Bowles <laughs> watched that game. Was like, I give my arms and legs to him. Yeah, I mean, the <laughs> offensive line performed poorly, and Baker Mayfield, to be honest, performed like he did at his worst moments in Oklahoma that nobody ever wanted to seem to talk about, um, other than mm-hmm. Colin Cowherd, who you just want to sh- hear shut up because it, right. he, he, he he has the. You know, excuse me. We're gonna. I'm gonna go ahead and go and now do it. Yes, now we're to the mouth. So yeah, I mean, yeah. that's just one of those deals where <laughs> whatever. So looking sorry, at, it, Joe. I think that's the yeah. first sorry Joe I've ever had. So I, I, I'd say once out of every ten years might not be bad. I might have to do that more often. I mean, fuck. Okay. Oops. Oh my too? god. So we're gonna have two things. To <laughs> It's like Derek wow. Wolf up here, man. Yeah. yeah, but no, I mean, the Browns were sorry. All those penalties, that was awful. Baker Mayfield, you know, missed some reads that he should have made. There were some plays that under pressure, he really didn't do a very good job of being able to go to that second read um, where he locked down a little bit too long or where when pressure gets high and he has to climb and flush out the side, he can't do that. He's better at backing his way up or rolling out. And if and if he can't do one of those two things, he's not the quarterback that everyone makes him out to be. So it's going to be an interesting season for Cleveland. Hopefully they just write the ship quickly, but with an offensive line the way it's played, I doubt that that's going to be the case. Bloom, I just saw you texting, and I was yeah. going to say, are you a pecker? But I mean a hunt and pecker. You know, yeah, I'm old, crazy. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hands on the desk. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Getting stuff past the sensors now. Oh, see. Well, we got the FCC on our side, right? Am I right, fellas? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> okay. K1. Uh, uh, tables spicy, have turned. Spicy live show. That's Jason right. Wood is very happy right now, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I yeah. think so. K1. Hey, FPG I want after dark. For you. Wood. Oh, there you go. There it is. There it is. Got to gotta get that. Oh, and on. you know who the instigator was? I'm sorry was? for David Montgomery. You know who the instigator yeah. was for this? Who yeah. was the Gene. hall monitor? Yeah, Gene, Dr. Gene. He yeah, was, see, see? Yeah. yeah, he's like he starts the trouble and he's then he leaves. Him. Yep, yeah. see, he did. So I apologize to all David Montgomery fantasy owners for <laughs> giving him that award before the season started. Um, because it's a curse, it really is. Mikel Ashur was the first motorboat and it was awful. So, everyone, Samaji P. Ryan, yeah, motorboat, David Montgomery, motorboat. And when I talked to Matt Nagy this week. And I asked him, like, what's David Montgomery got to do to earn a larger role? He's like, well, that's on us to figure out. Okay. Um, Had all of training camp and the preseason. And anyway. All right, boys. That is a wrap. I've got some editing to do. Yeah. (laughs) Bloom, you go this whole show. And, like, Dr. Gene's not going to cuss. But, like, Bloom doesn't even cuss on this one either. I would rather say a profane idea. You know, like something that would, would be crossing over some public standard, but I'm not going to do that. I, look, I can't even say people saying it's your first sorry, Joe. I may or may not have had a sorry, Joe, at some point. I think I would have not noticed. Uh, and so that's more likely how I would do it. That would be more on brand or in character for me. All right. That is a wrap for tonight's program. He's Sigmund Bloom. You follow him on Twitter at Sigmund Bloom. Matt Waldman is at Matt Waldman. I'm at Cecil Lammy. The show is at The Audible. Of course, Dr. Gene Bramble at Gene Bramble as well. Uh, also, yes, Richard reminds me here. Smash the like button for we gentlemen. Thank you, Richard, for reminding me because, and here's the thing. Um, the channel has really grown, like recently over mm-hmm. the last month, all because of you guys, because you're liking, commenting. Chat room's awesome. Need you to comment on the video too. Like, comment, share, subscribe, ring the notification bell because it really does help um, with YouTube actually putting our videos in recommended videos for other people to grow the channel, for people to be like, hey, what's this? Click, oh my God, this is so awesome. Or this is terrible, I don't know, whatever you want. But you guys are helping us and we're you know fighting the man because YouTube basically promotes corporate shows and not independent creators. So you know, do us a favor, you love the show, Check us out, footballguys.com. Sign up for our free dailies newsletter. And now you can check out the Audible on Spotify. Yes. I uh, might be a little bit behind the time. We, we're a little late, but we got it. Yeah. We're on Spotify. So everyone check us out there and, you know, listen to us 
on on your favorite device on the Audible. So for the fantastic Dr. Gene Bramble, the great Sigmund Bloom, and the amazing Matt Waldman, I'm Cecil Lammy saying thanks for watching. Stay tuned and stay frosty. Tugboat Peyton Barber with a score. Ha, ha, ha.